Hi, welcome to Creation Care Church Friday Night Live message. And today we're doing Psalm 24, All Belongs to God. So before we get started, a few announcements. One is that uh, fellowship will be happening after the live talk tonight. So if you'd like to join us on our Discord server, you can do that through the Connect tab on our website, creationcarechurch.org. Also, as we mentioned before, that we reached 1,000 followers on Facebook, so thanks for everyone who's been following and sharing. Uh, We also reached 100 subscribers on YouTube. So if you haven't checked out our YouTube channel, we have all of the live talks archived there where you could find them. And also, if you would like prayer, you can reach out to uh, creationcarechurch.org and info at creationcarechurch.org, and we'll be happy to pray for you. So those are the announcements. Let's start with a word of prayer. And also, if there's a, a sound issue, please let me know. Hopefully there isn't. All right, Heavenly Father, just thank you for being with us, and we just ask for your guidance in this topic, and just show us what it means that everything belongs to you, and what should we do with this information? How can we be those stewards that you created us to be? So just give us insight into this topic and be with us as we look into it. In your son Jesus' name, amen. And also, before we dive into Psalm 24, there's a short video that I would like to show you. So the video is by Live Mercifully. Mercifully friends, welcome back to this new series on Bible verses that support veganism. Today's video is on Psalm 24.1. Who do the animals belong to? If you haven't checked out the previous videos, be sure to do so. I made a playlist and I'll put the link to that below. So let's get into it. The earth is the Lord's and everything that fills it, the world and all who live in it. Psalm 24.1. The scripture is very clear. God owns the earth and everything in it, including the animals. If that's not convincing enough, this scripture is corroborated by other scriptures, including Psalm 50, 10 through 11, which directly states that God owns the animals and knows them all. When we look at the world today and at the exploitative way that animals are treated by mankind, it's clear that most people consider animals to be human property, but that's not the truth. God owns the animals, and that ownership was never relinquished. Our role is a stewardship role, not an ownership role. As Christians, knowing that God is the loving owner and we are the stewards, our attitude should be one of respect and godly love toward the animals, not thinking of them as mere resources for our own desires, but beautiful creatures who belong to God, and we are accountable to Him for how we treat His creation. Unfortunately, mankind has developed a very self-serving mindset when it comes to the animals. Their value seems to be in how useful they are to us. Instead of asking the question, what is God's perfect will in regard to how I relate to the animals? For many Christians, the question tends to be, what am I permitted to do? That mindset doesn't honor God's perfect will. And as we went over in previous videos, we know that God's original and ultimate will is peace and harmony among all creation, love and nonviolence. It's important to remember that God is the owner and we are the stewards of his creation. As was stated earlier, the fact that God is the loving owner of the animals should cause people to have respect for the animals, not thinking of them as property or commodities, but instead stewarding them with love, kindness, and mercy. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please give it a like and subscribe to this channel and hit the bell icon if you want to be notified of upcoming videos in this series. Wow, wasn't that an awesome video? I just love all of Live Mercifully's videos. 
And this one's especially cool because it, it talks about a topic that people usually gloss over. They think, well, animals were given to people to do with them what we want. But according to the psalm here, the animals still belong to God. And so we should still be doing with the animals uh, what God wants us to do with them. So that's a very important distinction. All right, so let's dive into Psalm 24. So Psalm 24, starting with verse 1, it says, The earth is the Lord's, and I'm reading from the New King James, and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. So the entire world belongs, belongs to God. Every person, every animal, every creature, uh, everything, everything belongs to God. And so when it comes to God giving us certain responsibilities, whether it's dominion, stewardship, uh, anything, that should always have God in mind, that God's really the owner, that we're just the managers of these things. So let's look at another psalm. Let's look at Psalm 50, verses 10 through 12. We're going to come back to Psalm 24. That's the main focus of what we're doing, but we're going to skip around a little bit. So Psalm 50, verses 10 to 12. So Psalm 50, verses 10 to 12 says, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hunt... Let's see. Oh, wait, that's it. So... So basically, the animals are all belonging to God. Everything belongs to God. And here he specifies, I'm also talking about the animals. All the animals belong to me. So if all the animals belong to God, then God should be the one who determines what we do with those animals. And of course, when he creates everything and says it's very good in Genesis chapter 1, and he gives humans dominion, makes us those stewards of the things that still belong to God. Then in verse 29, he says, eat the fruit of the tree and the green plants of the ground, that shall be your food. So clearly the food that God gave us is the fruit and the vegetation, not the animals. So the, the animals belong to God and he didn't give them to us to eat them as food. So we should respect that uh, and not treat God's creatures that way. And so in Verse 2, coming back to Psalm 24, everything belongs to God. Now, verse 2, it says, For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. So, again, this is kind of interesting. And if we go back to the creation account, it says there is these formless waters and the Spirit of God is hovering over the waters. And so, yeah, he forms everything on these waters. So let's look at Psalm 89, 11 to 14. And if you have any questions or comments, be sure to ask them in the, in the chat. So Psalm 89, 11 to 14. So Psalm 89, 11 to 14 says, The heavens are yours, the earth is also yours. The world in all its fullness, you have founded them. The north and the south, you have created them. Tabor, Hermon, rejoice in your name. You have a mighty arm, strong is your hand, and high is your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. So this is talking about everything belonging to God and God's throne. So he's the king. He, uh, he's in charge of every very important component. And so when we say all the animals uh, and everything belongs to God, well, we're supposed to be merciful. Uh, and so when it comes to animals, we should be merciful toward the animals as well. So continuing in Psalm 24, verse 3, it says, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? So that's a good question. Anyone have an idea of who might be worthy to stand in this place that belongs to God, stand in his kingdom uh, by his throne? 
Well, it says here in verse 4, it answers the question. It says, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. So what would this mean to have clean hands and a pure heart? Well, it says within the verse kind of part of what that's about. It says, uh, who has not lifted up their soul to an idol. So an idol would be uh, usually a statue, but really anything that you're worshiping other than God. So God requires our exclusive devotion. God is the, the object of our praise and our worship. And so we're not going after other gods, other idols, anything like that. So we're devoted to God. So that's the first thing. Uh, but then the clean hands and the pure heart. Let's look at Matthew 5, 8. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. And this is the Beatitudes, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. It says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So again, we have this idea of having a pure heart, and that this pure heart is something that is very important. And it says that you will see God if you have this pure heart. So who can stand in the presence of God in his kingdom where his throne is? And he says, the whole earth and everything in it belongs to me. And who is worthy to stand in this, this place that God created uh, to dwell among us, to dwell with us? And it says you have to have the clean hands, not worshiping idols, but you have to have that pure heart. So let's look at Psalm 51, 10 to 17. So Psalm 51, and we'll look at 10 to 17. So Psalm 51, 10 to 17 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. So here he's starting to talk about what that means to have that clean heart, or those clean hands and pure heart. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. So we want to have God's Holy Spirit in us. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with your generous spirit. So God saves us by his grace through our faith. And that salvation is to be our joy. We should be joyful in this free gift that we, that we receive. 13, then I will teach transgressors your, way, your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. So we ourselves put away sin, and we follow God, and then we teach others. So the Great Commission, Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all the nations, teaching them all the things that I taught you. And so that's another important component, is teaching. And then 14, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. So again, we receive that atonement through the blood of Christ and that forgiveness. So we have the blood of Christ on us, and that's what delivers us from our own blood guiltiness of falling short of his commandments. 15, O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. So we're praising God. And then 16 and 17, this is, this is where it really gets interesting. For you, for you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. So, he doesn't want these animal sacrifices. He wants a broken spirit, a contrite heart. These are the things that God wants from us. And so when it comes to animals, uh, a lot of ancient religions and such thought, well, animal sacrifices, that's what pleases the gods. But the God, the creator of the universe says, no, that's not actually what's pleasing to me. What's pleasing to me is for you to be merciful, to you have this broken spirit, this contrite heart, and to, to act righteously with justice. And these are the things that are really pleasing to me. And so I just like how that psalm really kind of brings that out. It starts with this idea of the, the clean hands and the pure heart, and then it, it kind of shows what that means in having that contrite heart. 
So we want to have that renewed spirit in us as well, where we love our neighbor as ourself, both our human neighbor and our animal neighbor, because both belong to God. So we should treat both with that love, which is that primary uh, character of God as well. Looks like we have a few more people joining us. If you have any questions or comments, ask those in the chat. We'll get that in the second part of the talk. All right, we're in Psalm 24, and we just finished verse 4, so let's go to verse 5. He shall receive blessing from the Lord, the one who has done these things, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. So the God of his salvation. Well, the God of salvation, whenever Jesus was about to be born, this, the angel comes to Mary and says, you shall call his name Jesus. Or in Hebrew, that's Yeshua. And that means uh, there is salvation. And so salvation is what that name of Jesus is uh, because he will save his people from their sins. And so here, uh, the righteousness from God of his salvation. So what does it mean to, to seek the face of God? Is it trying to you know, use this uh, facial recognition software? Or is it something else? What is seeking the face of God? Well, let's look at Psalm 27, 4 through 6. So probably going over one page. Psalm 27, 4 through 6. It says, one thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle, that's the place he dwells among his people, to tabernacle. He shall hide, he shall set me high upon a rock, and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. So here we have another description of a sacrifice that is offered. It is a sacrifice of joy and of song, praising God in song. So uh, this is very interesting how seeking his face is dwelling in the house of the Lord and beholding his beauty. So he says, the whole earth is my house. Uh, or is the, so he's, the house of the Lord is the dwelling place of the Lord, and he creates uh, everything to dwell among us. So we are to be his family. And I just think that's a really wonderful imagery of thinking of God as our father, and we're part of God's family. Like, who deserves to be part of God's family? No one. But he's so loving that he created us for that purpose, to be part of his family. And so uh, that, that's part of the beauty of, of dwelling with God and God dwelling with us. And what he asks is for us to have those clean hands and that pure heart. So we're devoted to him, we worship him, and we accept his invitation to be part of his family. And then we treat his creation as other family members. So we don't massacre our neighbor. We love our neighbor because that neighbor is also invited to be part of God's family. And the animals that belong to God, they are also invited to be part of that family. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the covenants, which we've mentioned before, but we'll come back to again, about how God covenants also with the animals. They're part of that covenant family. So we want to treat all of our family members, both human and animal, as beloved family members in this family of God. All right, so coming back to Psalm 24, it was about seeking your face. It says, lift up your hands, O gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Well, who is this King of glory? Just like the song, who is this king of glory? I know uh, singing is not my spiritual gift, so you just have to bear with me on that. So who is this king of glory? That's what the next verse says in verse eight. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. 
So what's that about, this king of glory in battle? Well, is is God this warrior God that sheds blood and all that kind of thing? Or, or who is this king of glory? So a good question. And let's look at a couple of passages. Let's look at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. So 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And we're going to look at verses 7 and 8. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8 says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of our glory. So it was ordained long ago. It says that that wisdom of God was in the beginning and all things were created through it. And then verse 8, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So who is this king of glory? The Lord of glory, uh, Jesus bringing salvation to us. So this is the king of glory. And if we look at Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 16. So Revelation 19, verses 11 to 16, this gives uh, a more detailed description of this king coming in his glory to fulfill his throne, to fulfill this uh, prophecy. So Revelation 19, starting with verse 11, says, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. So what kind of war is this? Well, let's continue. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. Well, what was this name? Anybody know what that name was that was written that nobody knew except himself? Well, if you continue reading, usually scripture will uh, interpret itself, will tell us what it means. So if we continue reading in verse 13, He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So there it answers the question from the previous verse. What is his name? His name is the Word of God. Okay, well, now let's go to John chapter 1, starting with verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and nothing that was made was made. So there's this word of God, and then in John 1, verse, uh, what is it, 13? He was born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So he became flesh and dwelt among us. That was 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So here we know that the word of God is Jesus, and that's who is riding on this white horse. So I know horse riding's not vegan, but you'll just have to, he's fulfilling prophecy. I'm not sure if this is metaphorical or literal, the white horse part. Uh, So he has this name, and he's dipped in blood. This robe is dipped in blood. So that's representing the crucifixion where he gave his own blood. He shed his own blood for the remission of our sins. So we get that forgiveness. And so that we're restored to that, that relationship with God. And then 14, and the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. And elsewhere it says, clothed in fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints says that in, if we scroll up, I don't know if you're using a computer, I I can't really scroll using a Bible, but I guess it used to be scrolls. So if you go up to Revelation 19, verse 8, it says, And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So there it describes what the fine linen is. It's the righteous acts of those following God, So then in 14, when it says, clothed in fine linen, 
Well, these armies are clothed in the righteous acts of the saints. So they're clothed in Christ and they have this righteousness. So they're following him. And it says they're following him on white horses. So I think that's kind of what the white horses also represents is that righteousness of following Christ. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Well, who's that? That's Jesus, clearly. And so that's the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. But interestingly, in verse 15 here, it says, out of his mouth comes a sharp sword. Well, what's in your mouth? It's the tongue. And so your tongue is your weapon. And whenever Paul's talking about the spiritual armor and things of that nature, uh, it's, it talks about the tongue being our weapon. And so he's not coming with a sword to, to slay everyone and cut off their heads and establish a kingdom through bloodshed and violent conquest. No, he's doing it through the tongue. And that's why he says uh, when, his, when they're, he's being taken away to be crucified, he says, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight uh, to prevent this arrest. But no, my kingdom's not of this world. And so instead, he sends out his disciples to make disciples of all the nations. They receive the Holy Spirit, and they sp start speaking in tongues, and they convert people through their, uh, through their words. So here, Jesus comes with the sharp sword coming out of his mouth, which would be his tongue. I don't think he's liter a literal sword is coming out of his mouth. Like he's one of those magicians that like pulls a sword out of his mouth or something. Maybe, I don't know, I, I, I guess, I, I think that means the tongue. I think that's, there's a lot of imagery here. And so we have the righteousness, we have the, the coming to establish the kingdom, and he's doing so with his tongue. So let's go back to Psalm 24. Finish up there. So Psalm 24. And we're talking about the king of glory. And that would evidently be Jesus. So verse 9, lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, you everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. So amen. Uh, we're looking forward to that day where he comes to establish his kingdom because all belongs to God. It always has and always will. But now he's going to come and dwell among us and he's going to establish his kingdom. And so all the kingdoms of the world will no longer exist and it'll be Jesus and his kingdom. So if you have any questions, uh, we're about to get to that part of the talk. Let's see, Claudia says hello. Hi, Claudia. Lily, greetings everyone from California. Hi, Lily, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's that name again, uh, Anna Mikey. Hello everyone, a warm big hello from the Netherlands. Hi, thanks for joining us. Good to see you again. Uh, Liz, hi everyone, thanks for joining us, hi. Heidi, hello from rural Tennessee. Interesting, I grew up in Tennessee, grew up south of Nashville, and I went to school in Knoxville. So I'm familiar with Tennessee. Yeah, I hope you all can join us again next time. Let's see, Shirley says, hello everyone, thank you for, reach, for teaching. Uh, yes, the animals are part of God's family. Psalm 36, five, David prayed to God, O Lord, please preserve preserve both people and animals. Okay, so let's look at that. Let's look at Psalm 36, verse five. So Psalm 36, verse five, it says, your mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens and your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the great mountains. Your judgments are a great deep. O Lord, you preserve man and beast. Amen. Yep. 
And I think that's really important is that everything belongs to God and he also preserves uh, that. So he preserves the animals. And so when he gives us that dominion, and in fact, let's, let's look at that. So we have that dominion in Genesis chapter 1. And it says, verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So he's making us to be like God. And if God preserves the animals, then we should likewise be preserving the animals. And that's what happens. He says, Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, uh, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So that's what he does. He, he creates us in his image to likewise preserve the animals. And so we should be taking care of them. We should be feeding them. And that's what it says. And uh, for instance, verse 30, Genesis 1.30, it says, Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. And so he's giving this food to the animals. And so then in Genesis 2.15, uh, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. So we're the ones maintaining, keeping, tending, shamar. That's to take care of, protect. So we're taking care of the animals. We're making sure they're fed and preserving them, just like God preserves them and preserves us. And so that's what it would mean to exercise that dominion in God's image and likeness. And so we want to definitely be those good stewards and not be exercising dominion in our own image according to what we want it to be. We should be exercising it in God's image in the way that he designed it to be. So that's a, a very important distinction that I think uh, people need to make. And if we look at uh, 1 John 4.16. If you have any other comments, be sure to ask those. So 1 John 4, 16. It says, where am I? Oh, 4. I was like, this isn't what I was looking for. First John 4, 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. So if this is God's character, this is the likeness of God, is this love, then the way that we exercise that dominion, that stewardship, preserving the animals, would be through love. And I think most people at least have some intuitive sense of what love is. And uh, if you want a more detailed account of what the Bible describes as love, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's an entire chapter on love. But I, I think that we kind of understand that like at least these things are not love and these things are love. And then maybe there's some like middle ground that we're not sure about. But, you know, killing someone would be not love. And love would be, you know, taking care of someone, preserving someone. So we don't want to be killing the animals to eat them or whatever. We want to be showing them that love. And if we look at Galatians 5, 22 and 23, that's Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, it describes what what the fruit of the spirit is and this is if you're if you're born of god if you are following god if you're exercising that that faith in the image of god then you'll be bearing these fruits it says the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace long suffering kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self-control against such things there is no law so we want to be exhibiting those fruits of the Spirit in how we exercise that dominion over God's creatures, right? We want to be showing them peace, showing them love, uh, instilling that joy in them, and exercising that self-control 
so that we're not serving the desires of our flesh, not serving our God being our belly, but instead serving God who it tells us to act through love and peace and mercy. And so that's how we want to, to treat everyone, including our animal neighbors. Let's see. Yep, sorry for my name. You may call me Anne much easier. Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, Anne, much easier. I will call you Anne from now on. So these, these fruits of the Spirit that we were mentioning, where it says the, the goodness, well, what, what would we know is goodness? And if we look at Genesis chapter 1, we see this coming up a lot. At the end of each day, uh, God says, and it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. And then after he created humans and gave us that dominion, uh, then at the end of that day, it says something slightly different. It says in uh, Genesis 1 verse 31, then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So if God sees everything as good, including this dominion that includes like eating the fruit of the tree and the green plants of the ground, not the animals, and we're bearing this fruit of the spirit of love and joy and peacefulness and gentleness, well, we're bearing goodness. Well, goodness is what God created in the beginning. He saw that it was good. So we're following that thing that God created that is good, that is very good. So if we're bearing the fruit of the spirit, that goodness would reflect that goodness that God established in the beginning. And the faithfulness, we would want to exercise that, that faithfulness toward God, where, again, we have those clean hands and the pure heart where we're faithful to God. Uh, but then also, if we look at Matthew 24, 45... So Matthew 24, 45, it says, uh, Who then is that faithful and wise servant or steward whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season or at the right time? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. So that's kind of interesting, right? Where... What did God do? He created the whole world and he made us these, these stewards, these masters, the managers uh, over his creation. And he tells us how to be those keepers of uh, his created world. And so we want to be those faithful and wise stewards, uh, following God's instructions and embodying his character and how we do that. And so that when he comes back, so the master is returning to establish that kingdom. That's remember the, the king of glory. Uh, he's coming. And so when he comes back, he wants to find us doing those things. So he doesn't want to see that we're doing the opposite. And he wants to see us doing those things when he returns. So that's what we should be doing. Amen to that, right? Hopefully. So I have, a, I have a question, if anybody would like to chime in, we can address these. So the question is, has there ever been a time where somebody has said to you that uh, I can do whatever I want with, with, let's say, I can eat whatever I want because uh, it's mine, I bought it with my money, or I can do whatever I want with, you know, my money, my house, my car, my anything, where they say, well, it belongs to me. And so I can do with this thing that belongs to me, whatever I want. Or people even say that about their own bodies. They say, I can do whatever I want with my body. I can live the way I want. My life is my own. I can do whatever I want. But according to Psalm 24, it says all belongs to God, including everyone in it. So you yourself belong to God. And so, yeah, the question is, has anyone ever said that uh, to you, that it's like, 
I can do whatever I want with this thing that's mine. And I want to hear about that if you, if you if that's happened. So Lily, I think that truly understanding that God owns everything helps us to not hold on too tight to material and temporary things, which unfortunately is what a lot of people do. Oh, that's a good point. So yeah, I think that we do kind of live in, at least in Western culture, uh, I'm in America, so in America this is very much pronounced. It's a very sort of materialistic culture where we want to have the latest technologies, we want to own the biggest houses, the fanciest cars, the you know uh, the the jewelry that's expensive, and the uh, just have 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 its material things. And I think that whenever we are pursuing those things, uh, it kind of takes away from the things that are really supposed to be prioritized. He says, uh, where your heart is, that or where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And so if we're treasuring all these material things, then that's really where our heart is. But he says we should lay up our treasure in heaven, where moth doesn't destroy and rust doesn't destroy and thieves don't break in and steal. And so if we're prioritizing the kingdom of God and the ways of righteousness and following God and showing love to those around us, then those are the things that thieves can't break in and steal and moth and rust won't destroy. And I think that when we put our focus back in the place it should be, and we're not going after those things of the world, then our walk with God is, is, is more authentic. We can draw closer to God because we're living that lifestyle that he designed us to do. And you're right, it's like these things are temporary. Everything's temporary. And if we think of it as, well, everything belongs to God anyway, then it's like, well, it's always going to belong to God. And so anything that I might temporarily possess is, is fleeting. And there's, there's nothing I can really hold on to. Some people say, uh, you can't bring with you your, your possessions to the grave. Uh, because when you die, you lose all your things. And it's like, yeah, but there is something that we can bring to the grave, and that is our salvation. And so whenever we're resurrected out of the grave, uh, we can be resurrected to eternal life. And so that's the, the greatest of all gifts, the greatest of possessions that, that we can have, because it's the one possession that, that we can bring with us to the grave, because that's the possession that will bring us out of the grave as well. So good point, Lily. Let's see, Liz, yes. Uh, I feel like owning everything and killing animals is ingrained in American culture. Yeah, that's uh, unfortunate, and I agree that for for the most part, that is generally true. Um, where I think that it's just this this idea of I deserve this, this freedom to, to have and make these choices that I want to make is sort of very central to the mindset. Uh, it's a sort of a Western mindset, but definitely pronounced uh, in America, maybe more so than anywhere else right now. Uh, but if we contrast that, this to, say, some East, more Eastern mentalities, like if you go to Japan, that uh, individual mindset is very different. It's, it's not like that. It's very much the collective first and then like the individual second. And it's interesting to, to think about how that plays out with uh, like honor and things like uh, you, you get sick and you put on a mask to prevent other people getting sick. And in America, it's kind of the reverse mentality where it's like, look, if you don't want to get sick, then you wear a mask to prevent me who's sick, like making you sick. And it's like, well, it's kind of, so you just kind of have this, backwards mentality where it's like I'm thinking of other people and I don't want to harm other people and then someone else is like uh, well if you don't want me to harm you then you need to protect yourself from me and, I, and, and I'm not talking about the whole COVID thing I'm talking about before that like when I went to Japan several years ago that's just part of their culture is you wear a mask if you are sick to prevent spreading your uh, your cold or whatever you have and that's just one example of, of 
putting others in mind first. And I'm not saying Japan's some uh, ideal to follow. I'm just saying that in general, this Western mindset does incline itself more toward that sort of consumerism. But I know Jesus also says you can't worship two masters. Uh, you can't worship both God and mammon, which is basically this embodiment of material wealth and like luxury. And so you can't go after that. And I think one of the important reasons why the two are incompatible and why Jesus makes that very clear, stark distinction between the two. We got disconnected for a second. Uh, so anyway, let's start over. The if, we're, if there's poor people who are starving and have no food and no money and no clothing and you're pursuing this luxury, wanting, you know, a third luxury vehicle and, you know, a five-story house or, you know, whatever kind of rich things you're pursuing and you're not caring about making sure the basic needs are met of your neighbor, then it's like you can't be pursuing those things and also be loving your neighbor as yourself. You have to, you have to sort of take your your eyes off of that pursuit of wealth in order to care about the poor in the way that you should. And so, I think that's a big part of it. And so, we definitely want to be thinking about the poor and things of that nature. All right, Heidi. I've read Christian Hunter's arguments that anyone who cares about the well-being of animals is unchristian and pagan worship, or insists that they are donating the killed animal meat to charity, so that makes it okay. Okay, so yeah, interesting point, and we've uh, this is one of our first live talks where it was uh, what does the Bible say about hunting? So there's two hunters that are specifically mentioned in the Bible. There's another one who's considered an archer, which it's unclear whether that's like a, a hunter archer or just a warrior archer. So, but the two that are clearly uh, without question hunters described in the Bible are Nimrod and Esau. So Nimrod is says the, the great hunter before the Lord and then there, uh, there's Esau, who is Jacob's brother. And it says that like, Jacob was the one that was pleasing to God, and Esau was displeasing to God. Uh, it even says God hated Esau. It doesn't say he hated him because he was a hunter, but he says he hated him, and it says he was a hunter. So uh, definitely kind of depicted as, wait, are we following the way of Esau, or are we following the way of Jacob, who is living in tents and not a hunter? And then Nimrod, it says he was the hunter. He's like the quintessential hunter uh, in the Bible. And he was the founder of Babylon. It says he went and made a city, and it was Babylon. And all throughout the Bible, even up through the book of Revelation, Babylon is the city that's uh, representing everything that's contrary to God. And it's contrasted with New, uh, New Jerusalem or just Jerusalem, uh, where that's like God's dwelling place. And so this, this hunter, this person who creates this city that all throughout the Bible represents the antithesis of God, then this other hunter is uh, one of the very few people in the Bible that it specifically says God hates this person then to me, I, I think that even though there's not some command in the Bible that says thou shall not hunt or something like that, well, there is thou shall not kill, so maybe there is. But the hunters that are mentioned are mentioned as these opposers of God. And so it's like, well, do I want to model my lifestyle after these characters in the Bible who are the uh, representing the opposition to God, or should I be living my lifestyle in a way that differs from theirs. So just some food for thought when it comes to the idea of hunting. So you're right with the, the showing mercy and things like that, definitely embodying God's character uh, more so than if we're just killing animals, especially if it's for sport, for sport. But yeah, definitely. And I think that the passage that you mentioned, the, the pagan worship or whatever, 
the passage that usually comes to mind when somebody says vegans are uh, serving demons, it's 1 Timothy chapter 4. So let's look at that. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. If I can find it. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 4 says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So it doesn't say people who are motivated by their faith. It says people who depart from the faith. So they're not talking about, let's say, a Christian vegan who's motivated by their faith to be vegan and show mercy and love to God's creatures and following God's original instruction, the very good diet to eat fruit and vegetation. Certainly not talking about those people. It's saying those who depart from the faith and are following doctrines of demons. It says speaking lies and hypocrisy. So teaching one thing and doing the opposite. Well, if you are vegan and you're teaching vegan, well, you're not speaking lies and hypocrisy, you're speaking the truth and acting in accordance with that truth. It says, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods, uh, certain foods which God created to be eaten with thanksgiving uh, by those who believe and know the truth. So what was the food that God created to be eaten with thanksgiving? Well, Genesis 129, the fruit of the trees and the green plants of the ground, that was the food and if somebody says, I command you to abstain from eating fruit and vegetation, well, that would be commanding to abstain from the things that God created to be eaten with thanksgiving. Well, we're not doing that. We're saying the opposite of that. We're saying that is what we should eat. And if they're saying, oh, well, anybody who uh, commands to abstain from eating any kind of food is following a demon, well, then I guess God has a demon because all throughout the Bible, God says, don't eat the unclean animals, uh, don't eat blood. And then in the beginning, he's saying, don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So God is commanding us to abstain from all kinds of foods. So clearly just commanding to abstain from foods doesn't mean that we're following a demon. And even the apostles said, don't eat uh, certain foods like foods that was offered to idols. So yeah, I just wanted to kind of give you a heads up on that. It seems like that's the kind of... Uh, issue that you're uh, facing. And so those are some, uh, hopefully some useful tools for speaking about that. Let's see, Donna, I don't consider five-story homes and three cars examples of wealth. In fact, just the opposite. Material things eat away at our wealth, our compassion, our environment, our health, our eternal life. Yeah, and exactly. That's the kind of wealth when Jesus is saying, uh, lay up your treasures in heaven, that that's really where true wealth is. And the, the world says, this is wealth, having money and buying possessions with this money. But he says true wealth is kind of the opposite of that, where it's uh, pursuing God and his righteousness. So you are exactly right. Let's see, one last question, Claudia. I have a great deal of sentimental value, sentimental value for quite a number of personal belongings, and to me, they hold a great deal of humbled, heartfelt meaning. That's not being materialistic. Need to keep the concept of materialism in perspective, is my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I think that people have things that, uh, that have significance to them, and if that thing you have significance of in your life that you know you're keeping for sentimental reasons is this gigantic diamond worth you know a hundred million dollars or something, then I might say, well, in that case, I think this might qualify um, because you're caring about those things instead of you know the the people that could be helped and the animals that could be helped, uh, but. I don't, I'm assuming that that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about small things that you have. And it's not, it's not the attachment to a particular possession, you know. Uh, it's more of this idea of what are you doing with your life? Are you pursuing wealth and luxury and fame and fortune? And like, are those the things you're pursuing in your life? 
Or are you pursuing the righteousness of God, pursuing closeness with God, pursuing that salvation, pursuing uh, spreading that, that salvation, that message of salvation, that gospel to those around you? Like, are those the things that you're really focused on? And so uh, that's, I think, the, the broader picture of what Jesus is getting at there. So I thank you for all of the uh, uh, comments and the questions. Hopefully some of those answers were helpful. Uh, so one last thing, the live talk next week, we have an interesting topic. It's drinking from the rock of Christ. So we're going to talk about what that means, and we're going to talk about where it comes from, what story in the, in the Old Testament that we get this idea of drinking from the rock of Christ, and then, of course, what that means, what that significance of that is in the New Testament, and then who was and will be and is drinking from this rock of Christ. So how can we know that we ourselves are drinking from this rock as well? So we'd like to have you join us for that talk next week. So let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, just thank you for uh, everything you do for us. Thank you for being with us as we uh, talked about this important topic and went through what it means for everything to belong to you. So just thank you for giving us your your wisdom and your word, and especially for your salvation that you bring to us, that we can be joined to you in eternal life in your kingdom one day. So we just thank you for that. We, uh, we hope that all of creation can come to repentance and likewise be joined to that eternal life with you. We pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. So we're about to have fellowship, so if you'd like to join us on Discord, I'll see you there. God bless.